Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday live stream. So a lot of things to go over. So let's just jump right in. Uh, first of all, I want to remind everybody that uh, today we did the NFA live show. It was a great lineup as usual. Uh, ben was hosted over on, on his channel and we had Jessica from Coin Bureau. And I got to tell you, towards the end, when we start talking about the altcoins, then Ben gets super excited. I'm just kidding to get that excited. But uh, some of Jessica's picks for altcoins were uh, pretty eye-opening. So I linked that in the description. You can check that out. We go over a lot of things and it's I, I dare to say, uh, quite a bullish video. So you can check that out uh, at your leisure. But today what we're here for is this, which is just crazy. It's just craziness because I didn't think this would happen. I didn't know how this came about. And I'm kind of flabbergasted right now, as you can tell, I'm trying to find the words. But this is from Bitcoin Magazine, uh, Elizabeth Warren, one of the staunchest detractors of of, uh, of crypto who uh, just recently came out uh, for her her campaign to say that she's any having an anti-crypto army comes out and uh, signs a certificate to honor this doesn't make any sense to honor Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto with a ceremonial flag flying Americans are forever grateful and this was broken by Bitcoin and at first I was thinking to myself is it's not the first of April this is this is real right and it just but uh, apparently it is. And this was uh, a piece that was put out by Bitcoin Magazine. I'll read it. But I'm going to start from the from the end of the article and, and move upward. I'll tell you why in a second. Because one of their their, their points that they made is that, and I, I've said this before, and we talked about the Bitcoin ETF being approved and, you know, how, how big it actually is. It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, inflows and outflows, even though we've got uh, 7 to 14x demand, uh, you know, coming in from, from the spot ETF, uh, as opposed to the actual amount that's actually being produced every day, which is 900 Bitcoin per day. It's, I said it didn't matter. I, I still don't think it matters to a, a massive extent. It was the narrative. The narrative was is that traditional finance is here and actually says that, you know what? This is its own asset class. So take that as you, as you will. But uh, this is what uh, the article states. Now that uh, U.S. regulatory agencies such as the SEC have allowed the approval of 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs, including Fidelity, FBTC, and of course iShares, which would be BlackRock, Warren has changed her tone, recognizing the immense economic freedom brought about by such a novel technology and now joins a, gro a growing group of elected officials throwing their name behind Nakamoto's protocol. I, I read this and I'm like, I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, I, I think I, you know, where we're, where we're coming from here. But uh, again, it's just from someone who was you know, so anti-Bitcoin and, you know, talks about how, of course, it is uh, used for massive illicit activity. I just found it uh, very interesting of the pivot uh, already. So uh, let's just break into the article and we'll kind of break this down uh, from there. So starting at the beginning, now this is, uh, of course, turn of events. Elizabeth Warren, want of adversary, says, yes, we're going to celebrate 15 years since the network launched. And here's the official document. <laughs> In honor of Satoshi Nakamoto for the 15th anniversary of Bitcoin, the first truly inclusive financial system that is providing new economic freedoms to populations previously ignored by both public and private institutions, Americans are forever grateful. Signed by Elizabeth Warren. Crazy. So this is in participation of the Capital Flag Program. Senator Warren's office submitted a request to commemorate Nakamoto's accomplishment of creating the first truly inclusive financial system with the colors of the U.S. flag being floated above the Capitol. Her career-long rhetoric about fighting for the net financially underserved has finally taken shape with this tangible statement. And I remember, you know, listening to Elizabeth Warren. That was what she ran on. Essentially, was going against the bankers. I just found it very odd that she would side against Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, Jamie Dimon was like her best friend. It was just like a, a crazy day. Uh, Thomas, Tomas Pakchia, nailed it. Co-founder of PubKey said this is a historic moment for how politicians in Washington view the promise and inclusivity of the Bitcoin protocol. What politicians do is much more important than what they say. I suppose so. Only one week before Warren ordered the flag down, the flag flown. Remember this. She introduced legislation to give the Treasury more tools to restrict the criminal usage of Bitcoin, making bold comments that they need new laws to crack down on crypto's use and enabling terrorist groups, rogue nations, drug lords, 
ransomware gangs and fraudsters to launder billions in stolen funds, evade sanctions, fund illegal weapons, and profit from devastating cyber attacks, creating an anti-crypto army in March of last year for her bid for re-election. So again, it is kind of odd to say this two weeks ago than to totally pivot and go, you know, we should celebrate this technology. It makes no sense. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section because I'm befuddled about what's happening in, in the background. I don't get it unless someone's got some great information. Anyhow, on that note, I'd also like to, I always like to share these little discrepancies or when when people bring up, bring up points uh, against Bitcoin, because it's the things that we all need to talk about. Because as we move into mass adoption, people are going to have questions for you. Look, if you haven't gotten the text messages or the talks from people who you would never have thought are getting into crypto or Bitcoin, essentially, you're going to start hearing more about that as we accelerate towards the Bitcoin halving. And one of those things they're going to say is, and of course, there's many things they're going to say, you know, do we really need this? Is this something that's uh, actually legit? Send Elizabeth Warren is crazy because she's, she said two different things. But one of those, this was from uh, Peter Zion. And we've played this, this clip over and over again. And the reason why I like to do this is because, you know, when you get these these objections, I think it's important that you know the answer to them so you can kind of, you know, go from there. And one of these objections that, that Peter talked about is, uh, of course, this was, he was on Joe Rogan and this was uh, back in, uh, I think, November, December, because he was talking about how Bitcoin's price was 16000 and he said it was, go, it was uh, going to uh, below 17000 or excuse me, it was 16000 and it's going to zero, which means it has 17,000 more to go. So I don't know what he was talking about as far as math goes, but the, you can listen to the clip. I linked in the description. But one of the things he talked about, he said, he goes, there's no way that we can lubricate the economy with only 21 million because there's only 21 million Bitcoin in existence. There's way more people in the world. How does that even work? That doesn't make any sense. And of course, it's uh, you know people that are getting uh, into the, the evangelicals and it's just a dangerous situation. I thought about that a lot. And it's something that I have massively dropped the ball on. And one of those things that I dropped the ball on is, and I think it's something we should all do, is remind people that, yes, even though it's 21 million, uh, you have to remember that for every Bitcoin, there's 100 million Satoshis within that. And to make that super simple, people complicate this, I don't understand why. But I said, I said, look, just remind that this, $1 is 100 pennies, if my math is correct. Correct me in the comments section. And one Bitcoin is 100 million Satoshis. That's pretty much what it's like. And I, if you take 21 million Bitcoin times 100 million sats, you get 2.1 quadrillion sats. That's a real word. I didn't really know. I didn't really realize that was a real word until we we're taking a look at uh, derivatives and how much is actually out there. It's over one, one quadrillion dollars worth. So when we talk about people say, well, there's not enough for the people out there. There's only 21 million. And then, you know, there's actually actually people have actually lost Bitcoin and, and these boating accidents. And uh, of course, they've they've uh, lost their, their passphrases. Just remind them, just go. You know, we've already mined 19 and a half million. We're going to get 21 million at some point, maybe 2140. But for the total amount is 2.1 quadrillion sats. There's plenty of that in the world. So just a little something to to throw out to people. So you can also remind them they don't they don't have to pay, you know, $53,000 or whatever it is today. They can just buy $10 and get a number of sats. I think it's something that I need to start doing a better job at. Anyhow, let me just think about that piece. And then also moving into... Uh, from the bear market to the bull market, I want to talk about the the things that are happening behind the scenes and all the the, the different progress that different uh, accounts have made, different products have made. And I always use this example because I feel that in the beginning, I mean, a lot of the crypto market was just, it's just hype and speculation. And I, I give a prime example of helium and alluvium. And both of those projects, you know, now they have like a working product. I just find it very odd. But Alluvium, I just wanted to, to, to showcase this, that, yeah, it was over $1,800 on 2021. And of course, yeah, of course, you know, we have so much as far as tokenomics and how much was actually get to, gets released. So yes, there was less there. But I mean, look, it went from almost 2000 down to just over $100 uh, for the token. And it didn't have anything at all back then. So I just wanted to highlight and say that from having nothing, and this is from Jesus Martinez, if you don't follow him and you're into Web3 and gaming, he's one of the best out there. He really knows what's happening. This isn't just some, some trailer. This is actual gameplay footage 
from the game that you can play right now, and they have four different types of games out there, that in my personal humble opinion, not being a big gamer, looks fantastic. And it looks like something that people would want to play. And then there's you know, this piece, and then there's stuff like this. I mean, these are the types of things that like, when I look at games and people say one of the biggest knocks on Web3 games is they suck and they aren't playable and they're awful. I'm, I'm hearing the exact opposite now that these Web3 games actually come to light and actually doing things. So I like what I see. I think Web3 is gonna be a great narrative. I could be wrong, <laughs> but let me know what you think in that in the comments. And then to finish up, uh, Truflation. There was, and we just talked about this a couple of days ago, February 13th, day before Valentine's Day. CPI numbers came out and there's just been some wonky things that have have been, as far as like the numbers go. And I just, some of these things just don't make sense. So what I did was I had uh, Stefan Rust. He is the uh, founder of Truflation. Cause I'm like, you guys are way off. Well, you guys are way off from the government numbers. I should say it like that. You, you're, you're, your inflation rate is 1.42%. And we're looking at CPI numbers of over two and it's, you know, I mean, it's coming down, but not as much. So I just wanted to bring him on and then just, uh, I did a quick interview. It's about nine minutes or so. So just take a listen to this and uh, just to tell me what you kind of think about this, because to me, when I think about what's happening with the actual numbers, it just, some things just don't make sense. And I think it really comes down to, uh, I think it really comes down to a presidential elections and then fudging the numbers, but man, I hope I'm wrong. So uh, just take a listen to this. Let me pull this up the right way so you can hear it. So again, what I want to do is bring somebody in who could uh, really shed some light about what's going on. Cause I don't, these numbers, they seem kind of funny and I don't really get it. So Stefan, thanks for coming back again to enlighten us about what's really going on. No, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Excited to be back and, and always good talking to you, Rob. I really enjoy it. And I think uh, you're doing a great show um, educating. And the more we educate people, the better the better everybody's armed and mm -hmm. researched to, to, to know how to handle with whatever situations put in front of us. Well, you know, what's great about that is, is what we get research is we have to get, you know, accurate data, first of all. So just to give everybody a little recap, uh, we had the headline CPI and core CPI come out and it's a bit uh, above of what was estimated from, you know, the uh, different, the powers that be and the economists. And they said, we'd be at 2.9, now we're 3.1. Thought they're gonna be 3.7, 3.9, so great. And what happened, of course, this was two days ago, you know, today it's, it's uh, the 15th of uh, February, and we can see that there was a little bit of a drop, no big deal, S&P 500, they also took a drop, recovered quite nicely. Uh, Bitcoin price, just taking a look at it. Yes, it did do a dip, but hey, looking pretty good. And then overall market itself, I mean, we're over two trillion, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. But Stefan, the, the, the thing about all this stuff is that, you know, we see these numbers come out from the government and we believe them to be true. Well, not all of us, but, but then I take a look at the dashboard here at Truflation, and it's saying something totally different. So run this down, how this is working and what the real numbers are. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we think our numbers are the real numbers and I'm biased, right? So take that with a grain yeah. of salt. But why do we think um, uh, uh, we're accurate? We track 18 million items. We have three price feeds per item. And you can see we have it in 12 categories versus the six categories versus the 80,000 items that the government tracks. Sure. Um, and so we just have way more data. We pull it in a real time basis. So we pull our, you know, um, through using APIs, taking a developer approach to actually acquiring um, all of this data and then making it updated every single day, getting it updated for everybody. And, and that seems to give us a number that people seem to believe is more an accurate reflection of what they're experiencing when they go to the gas tank or the gas station or to the grocery store or wherever they may be going um, and paying for mm -hmm. items. Yeah. Now, you have up above, by the way, if you go for an aggregated view in the top drop down, you can go to aggregated view. And then what we do there is highlight a three year perspective in terms of over the last three years, what and how will you have, or in this case, one year lost money, right? And so since the Ooh. beginning, 
you've lost 22% in purchasing power. So that's a quarter of your income that's basically just out the window. Um, that, and that's why with the pain is so big. People are really experiencing pain. pain. Um, mm -hmm. And when Yellen goes and says, oh, we're better off than pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, I don't know. I don't think the prices are going to come down than what they were before. Yeah, I can see it. I mean, especially as we take a look at this this aggregate. I do like this this piece because people will say, well, you know, it's coming down. Well, it's not really coming down. It's coming down from like these enormous highs that we had before. I mean, 24%. I mean, like you said, a quarter exactly. and then coming up. And then now we're, we're yep. seeing to be doing a reversal. So break this down real quick. If we're taking a look here as like what are the different numbers that just didn't add up when you took a look at uh, the data that came out of the government itself? Was there was there something that really struck out you like, wait, that doesn't make any sense? So we tried, um, the government did a couple of things this 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 month. Um, they changed the methodology um, uh, on how they're calculating. We're still trying to understand what the exact changes were um, and how they changed it. Their argument is the weightings have changed, the way people are spending. Um, that has changed. And so that's justification in terms of how they reallocate and change their weightings. That may be true. But what we found, you know, that really complex and, and, and confusing was the fact that gasoline prices for the month of January are down over 10 percent hmm. compared to the same period last year. Right. So they're down over 10 percent. So if you go to transportation and you look at the gasoline number, uh, which is the light blue number there in transportation, you hit the light blue number um, and and yeah. and. And by the way, transportation, and you can go there to the last dip there at the end. Um, yeah, there. That is now Jan. That is between December and January, uh, end of January, January thirtieth. So you can see that's a ten percent decline in something that is about a um, yeah twenty percent household expenditure goes towards transportation. So people are spending money on transportation. Now the cost of transport, you know, filling up the gas, filling up the car with gas has dropped 10%. Mm -hmm. That has to have a significant impact overall on inflation. The same is happening with owned dwellings. Owned dwellings have come down in pricing. So housing, you look at the owned dwellings. Why has that come down? Because a lot of people haven't renewed their mortgage uh, from when they ha originally put, had them out. 30-year-old uh, mortgages, why would I renew it in a time where interest rates are higher? So nobody's renewing their mortgages. And ultimately, over the last course of three years, I've paid down a lot of that outstanding amount. So my interest and the amortization associated with my outstandings have come down as well. And so, again, housing is some 23% of overall household spend. And so you add those two up, not to mention maybe food category, clothing category, they've all seen a big decline. So all of those combined should see actually a significant drop in um, actual inflation number for the month. Um, instead, the government seems to have some other number, which is um, a bit funny and weird to um, take into account. Do you think, j just by explaining that, do you think that as we get yep. closer to Super Tuesday, because here in the States, we're going to go through another presidential election. Do you think as we get closer to that election, those numbers that you're talking about will actually dramatically start to shift? And you might see a lot of different things go, oh, no, no, this is what it really is. And now we're doing a great job. Look how great the economy is doing. Is you think that they can go in that direction or they can go in the opposite direction? So, of course, that's a conspiracy theory. How dare you think like that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I'm but, just saying because the government is uh, it hasn't a great track record with us. We'll just say that. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to think it, but but I do feel I hate to say it, but I do think that actually, you know, that is definitely a high potential that that's likely to happen. There's a lot of money locked into money market funds. Um, mm -hmm. A tiny change in interest rates will unlock that liquidity. Where will that liquidity go? It'll go into the stock market. It will go mm -hmm. into alternative asset classes. Mm -hmm. And that's going to then help sway, create a lot of wealth amongst people, the middle class. And guess who's the biggest um, you know, winner of middle class wealth growth? It's going to be the Democratic Party. That's their constituent, right? Well, that and, of course, the people that are at the top. 
because the people yep, at the top, they, too. yeah, they have the uh, uh, Castillon or Castillon effect, where essentially the money yep. flows into the top and then gets Ooh, to okay. us at some point. So yeah, that's so I think that that by by high by keeping the inflation numbers slightly higher, they are justifying how to push out the decrease in interest rates. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, you know, they can then sort of make sure that hopefully it comes back and then ultimately drop interest rates at some point in time to fix the economy around the summertime. So maybe in June, they'll drop the interest rates and then the markets will start picking up when everybody comes back from the holiday. Boom, November here. What do I go and vote on? I'm going to vote on the people that are keeping a good economy. And Bidenomics is, is doing really well, right? It's really good for the economy. And that leads me apparently. to some of my last points which would be yeah. this just by you saying that we take a look at the fomc the target rate probabilities yeah. for the next meeting before before uh, these numbers came out we were looking at around a 40 60 split now we're looking at 90 yeah. percent. people say no no no. the target rate is 525 to 550 bips and we're going to stay there about 90 percent. you got still some people like no, no they're going to cut they're not going to cut and then the first of may what do we got yeah, 60, 60, 62, 34, and then even so, so, but I don't think it's going to happen. So like you just said, well, if they don't do it there, maybe they could push it out to here. To June, March, yeah. And then July. June, you can then see it's sort of slowly. Yeah. But they've got time and then 18th September. So as these yeah. numbers start to be jumbled, they can do essentially whatever they want to and uh, <laughs> get away with the things that they want to do. Unbelievable. I mean, it's really, yeah, I mean, that, and that's why we set out Trueflation in the first place is really to the one scorecard that really matters and tracks the performance of an economy. And uh, how do we make sure that that's independent? It is immutable. It is transparent. Our methodology, everybody's downloading our methodology. Go download it. Check us out. Hold us to scrutiny, right? Hold us accountable. Anybody can see how we calculate it versus it being hidden behind smoked rooms, in, in smoked rooms, behind closed doors, where they then decide on the day after they've announced the inflation updates, they then go and share their methodology in some murky sort of trans, you know, intransparent way that you have to decipher and figure out. Um, and this has been going on for nearly hundreds of years, right? This methodology is over 100 years. This process is really deeply ingrained into the system. And we need to, and, and what are we all doing in the blockchain? Why are we all so excited about digital assets? Why are we so excited about the blockchain? It's because it's bringing about a systemic change. And that systemic change is opening up markets that are going to allow for limitless participation. And I think that's the exciting element mm -hmm. and, and how do we do that within with real world asset metrics and, and, and score metrics that score the performance of our everyday lives. Yeah, well, that's I mean, that would lead me to my to the final thing, because uh, what I like about, you know, the, the site, first of all, it's free. Everybody likes free. But the other thing is that all the data that you guys pull in, I appreciate it. But I know that you guys were using a centralized platform. It wasn't AWS or Google it was another one. But of course, Digital like Ocean. when. Yeah, digital motion. So like when you do that, of course, things could go a little bit wonky because, you know, it's a centralized platform and that's pretty much how it is. And there's a new package coming out, a new essentially legal aspect from the European Commission Digital Services Act package uh, to create a safer digital space by essentially regulating the things that are being put out. And of course, if that happens in, uh, you know, our friends over the EU, of course, it can happen here. So. I'm glad you guys are moving away from essentially the centralized aspect and going to be doing a lot of things with the decentralized aspect. So all these different, so it looks like to me, like you guys are gonna be having your own nodes, verifying the data and pulling this data from over here from the centralized part and having everything run it through a decentralized multi-faceted uh, ledger. Is that essentially what's going on? Because it seems like a, almost like a deep in play. Yeah, it's, 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 so just to be clear, we've always been very decentralized already from the beginning. The only thing that we do is calculate the indexes on a centralized server. So that's where we have yeah. infrastructure requirements. And what we want to do is make sure that that index calculator is equally decentralized, as is our data. We partner very closely with Chainlink. Chainlink has, and the Link Marines have been super supportive of everything we do, and yeah. the Link, Chainlink ecosystem, right? So. They've taken us onto their platforms, all their node operators. They love the data that we provide and they host that data for us and support it across 
I think some eight eight different blockchains now. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Chainlink is becoming like a big uh, layer zero, essentially. And then it's yeah. not just an Oracle. And uh, that's why I hold it. So, okay. So, sorry, I misspoke on that one. Decentralized and now even more decentralized. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah. And now we're building on top of that infrastructure that they've built out. And we're running our data, our compute, on the result of our compute on their rails. So that's yeah. how we sort of look at it. They have this CCIP. They help us distribute the final indexes onto all the various dis different blockchains and broadcast the final indexes on those blockchains. Not only the indices, also the pricing data and the different categories that we have across all of those different chains, which has uh, been really brilliant. But our goal is to set up a Trueflation stream network that allows not only the qualification and verification of all real world asset pricing data, but also allows for the compute of indexes and enabling data analysts or any participant to go and create their own index with the verified data that's out there and monetize that by distributing that to decentralized exchanges, to liquidity pools, to um, yeah, synthetic assets that are gonna be built using these data feeds. Man, exciting times. Okay. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, you said a lot and a little bit of time as usual. I appreciate you coming on and, and, and schooling us about what's happening. Again, everybody, if you're looking for just to, to dig the data, I'll link Trueflation's website and the links uh, in the description uh, below. But Stefan, thanks again for stopping by. And of course, we'll have you on as things get updated. Yeah, no, thank you. And Ooh, Yeah, so thanks, Stefan. It's always good. It's always good when Stefan comes on because like, I like to break down that information, especially with the CPI numbers. I just don't trust it. It just seems like it's a, it's a game and they're, and they're moving around data points. And then of course, when we have a, uh, you know, our elections coming up in November, it just seems like all of a sudden I think things are going to just turn around miraculously, but uh, I could be wrong. Also, uh, I wanted to make mention of, uh, there's this tool uh, from trueflation.com forward slash calculator. Talk, it talks about, excuse me, what's your personal inflation. You can put your numbers in. You can actually see how much your uh, purchasing power is actually decreasing. So i link that in the description as well. But that is it for today, everybody. So first of all, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive.